Hi, uh, thanks Christine, and thank you to API Vote and the uh, Civic Leadership USA for uh, organizing this. So my name is James Hong, I am the Deputy Director at uh, of State Capacity Building at State Voices. Uh, which you've heard about, it is, uh, it is the uh, network of statewide coalitions uh, that are called tables. Uh, these tables uh, are in 23 states and were comprised of hundreds of grassroots organizations uh, that want to break down barriers to civic participation and bring underrepresented and marginalized populations, especially people of color, uh, and their issues to the center of public discourse. Um, and with me on this panel, uh, some great uh, people in the community and in those uh, and in the states, um, which uh, I'll get to in a second. But the the topic of uh, today's panel uh, it is uh, coalition building, and I'm sure many of you, may, maybe all of you, have done some kind of coalition building, uh, even if it's not nonprofit coalition building. And as somebody at the Apex uh, conference said yesterday. It is certainly not for the faint of heart. Uh, <laughs> yes, we know how hilarious uh, coalition building is. Um, really, you know, and I was thinking about why it is so hard, and uh, it came down to the fact that we are building consensus beyond our organizations. You know, it's so hard to build consensus even beyond our own selves, uh, even within a group of people, but then to go beyond uh, even an organization that you're embedded in, uh, I think that is, uh, you know, that is the task that makes it so hard. We're creating understanding and we're getting commitments uh, and a shared purpose with others and actually then creating processes for getting that agreement into action. Um, so today we're going to talk about building coalitions, diverse coalitions, and, uh, and allies around civic engagement. Now, we've been talking a lot about how the API uh, community has grown and we are building power, uh, but even now and even in 10 years, we're still going to be uh, a part of the equation that gets to the change that we really want. So, uh, with that being said, you know I do want to introduce our coalition, uh, sorry, our uh, panel members who are doing some of that work on the ground. Uh, so, not in order, but uh, there's Fahina Tabaki Pasi, uh, who's the uh, executive director of the National Tongan American Society. So, the NTAS came to be in 1994 because of uh, local Pacific Islanders who needed assistance to become citizens, and since then, it's increased its mission. Uh, to include health and education, and it's now uh, more focused on integrated voter education. Now, the coalition, and I'm going to introduce the organization and then also the coalition that they're part of um, and that they're leading, uh, it is the Multicultural Engagement for Utah. The ME4U, that's their acronym. So the ME4U is focused on civic engagement. Oh, sorry, me for you, me for you. Uh, focused on civic engagement and it started in 2016. It, it consists of organizations from Hispanic, African American, Native American, refugee, Asian Pacific Islander, women of color, and also millennial organizations. Um, and yes. So that's, uh, so that's from Utah. And then here we are, also we have Min Nguyen, uh, who is the executive director of, the, of Vela New Orleans. And Vela is a progressive, multicultural, community-based organization that empowers youth and families through supportive services and organizing for cultural enrichment and positive social change. Vela started something called the Power Coalition for equity and justice in Louisiana. And this is a coalition of community-based organizations working together to move an integrated civic engagement and targeted voting strategy seeking to unify and expand voices uh, across the state. Uh, we have Kimberly Sermi from Ohio. She is the manager of policy, advocacy, and development and the development department um, at Ohio uh, Asia, uh, which is Asian Services in Action. Um, Asian Services in Action is the leading AAPI-focused social services and health services organization in Ohio, uh, serving 58,000 individuals annually. 
Um, it's open to main social services offices in Northeast Ohio, and uh, it is in the heart of Cleveland's Asia town. Um, and the coalition that it's leading is the AAPI Civic Engagement Network of Ohio, so the ACE Network, which was established to improve community life and to foster collaborative partnership aimed at advancing civic and social responsibility. So today the network has 13 organizations in four of Ohio's main regions, uh, reaching over 35,000 plus APIs annually. And last but certainly not least, from my home state, uh, Murad Awada, uh, the VP of Advocacy at the New York Immigration Coalition. So the NYC is the largest state immigration coalition in the country. Uh, we have a, or they have a diverse mix of 200 plus members, uh, grassroots groups, organized labor, business, academic institutions. And it represents and advocates for New York's four million immigrants to expand the rights and uh, strengthen their integration. So that was a lot, sorry, I wanted to get the introductions out of the way so that we could really dive a little bit deeper into uh, coalition building um, and coalition work. But of course, feel free to uh, add on to, to, those, uh, to those comments. Um, I'd like to point out that we actually have a, a bit of a diversity in terms of the coalition that we have. So for example, um, the New York Immigration Coalition is its own organization. It is a C3 on its own, while some of the other groups, um, and the Power Coalition, I, I, that is also its own 501c3, uh, but Fahina's group and Kimmy's group, this is more of an ad hoc type of coalition, where they're coming together with other organizations, and they are, but there's no actual other entity. So th there's a little difference there. I think that might come out in the comments. So um, yeah, I'd like to just uh, go down the row and uh, you know, Christine asked us to have a, like, a little bit more conversational, so please uh, be thinking of questions that you would like to ask and there will definitely be time at the end uh, for us to have a bit of dialogue. Uh, so if you could give us a, you know, tell us a story of the coalition. So I've given some basics, um, but if we can go down the row and, and just tell us a story of of uh, you know how it came together, um, and if you could you know when was it formed, and what type of organizations are there? Why did you come together? Um, yeah. Hi everyone. Um, why don't we do a poll real quick while we before we begin our our roll to make sure everyone is awake <laughs> after lunch. Um, so how many of you guys ha currently have an existing coalition that you manage around civic engagement? Kind of hands in the air. Or how many are thinking about formulating one or in the process of formulating one right now? Okay, good. So it's, it's a good chunk of y'all. Um, okay, so the ACE Network was is a citywide coalition in Ohio, um, primarily focused on civic participation. So we do voter registration, GOTV initiatives, education, um, and get out the vote or voter turnout campaigns on election day in the weeks leading up to election day um, in four of the main regions where there are AAPI dense populations. Um, it was created, we solidified the network in 2014, um, starting out with four organizations. Um, and from there, in 2016, expanded to 12 organizations, and today we have 13 active, um, funded organizations. We have additional organizations, student groups, we have a student involvement campus program um, where we stipend out student groups to do GOTV campaigns, but primarily we have 13 active organizations um, who do integrate year-round integrated civic engagement activities. Um, and we created the group basically first, um, we saw a need in civic participation in the, primarily in the Cleveland market. Um, there was a lot of refugees and immigrants who were taking the leap to become U.S. citizens and getting naturalized and um, we saw a gap in terms of making sure that they were taking the next step and educating themselves around voter activities, the election, um, and then turning out to vote. Um, so we started from there and expanded into the Columbus market, Cincinnati market, um, as well as the Akron market, um, and have continued to reach up to 35,000 individuals each year. Hi, everybody. Um, so so we were talking about our organization or the, or the coalition, the coalition specifically both. So for uh, for Vail, we Vail started right after Hurricane Katrina. We were battling um, a landfill that was placed in our community. Um, and obviously during that time, 
um, our parents and our grandparents were um, fighting to, um, were, were working on rebuilding our homes. And that's when we, as young people, um, we saw that there was an opportunity for us to take the lead. So we began to, um, you know, the reason why the, you know, I had to ask, like, why, do you, why would you put a landfill in our community, right? The, our community is predominantly African American and Vietnamese. And um, they said, the, like, what, what everybody else has been talking about is like, the reason why they put a landfill in your community is because y'all have no power. I said, like, what do you mean have no power? We have electricity. And I was like, no, no, no. You, you I don't vote. And I was like, oh, well, I'm going to change that. So, so the first thing we did was we, we began to register people to vote. So today, we could, I could actually say that we registered more than 60% of the API voters in the state of Louisiana. So we really changed, changed the game. Um, so, so that's just like a little history about our organization and making sure that you know when people want to take advantage of us, we just we need to resist and fight back. Um, and I think you know what we were saying earlier, young people play a huge role in that. Um, and then for our coalition, um, we even though we we built power, we was still um, there was there was an active um, uh, movement to like really. Um, to hurt us, right? To, to, to push us out. And at every state level policy, we were losing. And that's when uh, my friend and I, and Ashley Shelton with One Voice, and uh, Norris Henderson, who worked in criminal justice um, uh, issues, we were like, you know, we're, we're losing all the time. And we're, we're working in silos. And you know, we were like, you know, I'm sick of this. You know, we gotta do something different. So that's what we thought about. Let's let's bring people together. Let's bring organizations that have a, um, a base, a base building organization together, and let's see what we can do. And that's when we form the Power Coalition because we want to have power, right? And that's when, you know, from so we started um, the conversation in 2012, and then kind of solidified in 2013, and um, we. We were, uh, you know, we were trying to figure out how to build power, and uh, we we did that. We, we we created like a vision and all this great stuff for Louisiana, and then uh, we we were lucky to um, you know get in contact with the Cotton Foundation. They offered us. They were we were the guinea pig, of, as uh, Sue uh, would say. Uh, they gave us money to fund uh, different organizations. Uh, throughout the, the uh, throughout New Orleans and throughout uh, Southeast Louisiana, and from there we were able to mobilize um, you know voters of color um, throughout the state of Louisiana, and we were able to um, mobilize voters of color uh, who who are infrequent voters, and uh, in result we have. Um, a, a Democrat uh, governor in a blue state. Uh, we would never imagine that that would happen, but we now we do. And that was red a red state. state sorry, <laughs> um, a Democrat governor in a red state. Because um, we were, we're traditionally blue cities, but definitely in a red state. I'm sorry. So from there, we were able to push different policies through like, a lot a lot easier than we, we expected. And, um, and then not only that, we were able to become a little bit more sophisticated. And uh, we actually hired our, an executive director and um, became a state table with state voices. And then we're doing a lot of other things too, but I'll, I'll, I'll save it for, for other things, so, for other questions. Thanks. Um, the National Autonomous American Society is probably one of the very few organizations, Pacific Islander serving um, organization in, um, in Utah. Um, the Me For You or the multi-engaged, um, um, multicultural engagement uh, for Utah Coalition was started uh, basically because um, we started, when we, uh, when we were working with the, the Culture Foundation, we started um, um, enrolling folks, uh, voter registration, and of course we'd already been doing um, citizenship work and all that kind of stuff. But uh, what at that time, we were also open to serving a lot of other folks. We had Hispanic folks come to, uh, to help uh, for help and citizenship. 
workshop, we had refugees, we had different organizations coming to us. So we had already built relationship at different levels with some of these folks. And when we got this opportunity to really focus on voter registration, um, our, of course, the focus was AAPI. And our refugee partner came to us and said, do you think we would be able, can we join your, you know, your, your coalition? And I'm like, you know what, let me check. So of course I called Sue and I said, do you think it's okay if we bring on some refugees? And said, oh yeah, that's fine, go ahead. And then of course a Latino came on later on, do you think we can, well let me check. So the second time I, I talked to Sue, she said, yeah, whoever, whatever, you just throw whoever you want. And so that's really how our coalition, the Me For You um, coalition started, was because a lot of people in Utah, of course Utah is predominantly white, and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders were only 1% of the population of Utah, so it almost seems like we have no voice. And then when we're siloed in the different um, ethnic community, um, the largest population there of ethnicity is the Hispanic. And so coming together uh, helped to increase our voices in many different issues that were experienced by the different communities. And then of course voter registration was one of that. And so coming together um, helped us and uh, to combine our voices, to get the training that we needed from the different uh, resources that was available to us, and, uh, and of course, funding also available to those um, that was in, within the coalition to help within their different ethnic communities. And then we've even gone as far now as we um, have a Women of Color um, Council that's part of the coalition, and then most recently we've added a, because there's such a low turnout between the ages of millennials, eight, uh, 16 and up. Um, we have brought on another organization that was interested in joining that uh, their main focus is millennials from 16 to 26, and then of course with the ethnic communities. And so um, that's kind of like how our coalition started. Hello? All right, perfect. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I just get hell out of some of you because I saw a bunch of people jump out of their chairs for a second. Uh, disregard the screen that says my name is Stephen Choi. I am not Stephen Choi. Um, uh, my name is Murado Wauda. I'm the Vice President of Advocacy at the New York Immigration Coalition. Uh, we were founded in 1987 uh, after the uh, Immigration Relief Bill of 86. Um, and slowly began doing advocacy and policy work that we saw the need arise within the state of New York. Um, we are truly statewide with members from Buffalo in western New York down to the east end of Long Island. Um, a lot of our work right now is focused around advocacy and policy um, and a big uh, strategy within our advocacy and policy has always been civic engagement. Um, and for the past 15 to 18 years, we've registered over 400,000 people to vote. Uh, we've engaged over a million uh, new Americans in the electoral process and have slowly, continuously built up an immigrant votes campaign. Um, this is probably the largest campaign we've had uh, in 2018 with over 15 partners across the entire state of New York. Um, what makes New York unique in a way is that um, don't think of New York as New York City first. Um, immigrants are spread out throughout the entire state. And I think that that's a piece that people tend to forget. Um, that we have folks in uh, the agricultural parts of the state, in western New York, the southern tier, central New York, um, where they're farm workers. And the vast majority of them are undocumented. Um, or are on uh, a type of visa that pretty much makes them a seasonal worker who comes in during uh, the spring and leaves uh, right before the winter starts. Um, and what we've seen in that is that uh, folks who are here, seasonally or not, uh, end up getting involved in their communities because they're faced with a lot of injustice. Um, and we'll talk more about coalitions, but I think that one thing about uh, coalitions that is very unique is being able to walk the fine line of always showing up for each other um, in a meaningful way, not just doing it when the house is on fire, but before the gasoline gets poured. Um, so that takes a lot of work and a lot of intention uh, years out. 
Great, thanks. Um, so I'd like to, for us to just push right into, you know, kind of the meat of coalition work. And, you know, as I alluded to earlier, uh, coalition work has a lot of uh, challenges. It is literally just the definition of coalition work, a challenge. Um, and, you know, I'd like just to hear from uh, from you all, like, you know, what, what does that look like and what has that looked like? And, uh, maybe some examples uh, from from your coalitions or even other coalitions that you may have been part of. I know um, NYIC is part of many other coalitions besides being a coalition itself. Um, I know, Kim Lee, you, you guys did a reboot of your coalition. You had a civic engagement coalition kind of, you know, you went on for a few years, you rebooted, uh, you started again. Fakina, you actually had a coalition and then then you came up with the multicultural coalition in addition to that one and sort of stepped back from the first uh, uh, rather intentionally. And I know Min, you know, I've, I've heard, uh, you know, the power, uh, power Coalition, I know that also had its own challenges. So, um, you know, whether it's internal or external, um, perhaps you could you know, share a little bit with uh, all the folks here. No one, no one here who has been doing coalition work is a stranger to uh, to the difficulties of it. Um, so, if you could, you know, point to a greatest challenge, uh, or say what was difficult for you or your staff or uh, other people uh, while doing your work. Anyone? Um, I'll jump in and um, kind of like share uh, my experiences as far as challenges and the likes. Um, First of all, um, I have worked in coalitions in, or in for many years now. Uh, I was a part. We are NTS has been a part of a. It's called Community Faces of Utah, which is a health coalition, which works with also multicultural. Um, and, you know, we work with the uh, um, Baptist Baptist Church, uh, African American Baptist Church. We work with Hispanic Task Force. We work with Best of Africa with his uh, refugee organization. Work with um, Urban Indian. Um, Urban Indian Center, and then of course Pacific Islanders. We work, and in that coalition, we also have the Utah Health Department. We also have the University of Utah, and Select Health, which is kind of like an insurance company. So we have not only coalition with local organizations, um, ethnic organizations, but also with businesses and institutions and agencies. Um, that organization I was with for and still with uh, for going on 10 years now and it has uh, been the model when this opportunity came to create a civic engagement coalition, um, I used that model and the model was such that um, nobody really, everybody comes to the table, you throw your degrees out at the door, everybody is an equal person at the table where you bring in um, you know, what the needs are of your community and everybody kind of comes to consensus and then there is one person in there, uh, which is higher, that basically kind of like is the liaison, makes things run, it's kind of like the, the grease and the wheel to make things move forward. Because oftentimes you'll find that um, people are busy with their real jobs, you know, and they don't really have time to coordinate or do things, that the, the little basic things to get things together to pull that coalition together. Um, so when we went into this building, this uh, civic engagement coalition, we started out with the um, Pacific Islander Community Coalition. So we had several, uh, we had like five different Pacific Islander organizations that were a part of that. And of course some of the challenges that we came, and, and I brought that model into that organization because I wanted everybody to feel like this is your baby, okay, this is, I wanted everybody to take ownership of it. I didn't want it to feel like that they were under NTAS so that I had the final say or all that kind of stuff. It was, you know, everybody was equal at the table. And, um, you know, as we were beginning with that, um, of course, some, um, you know, there were some issues as far as the challenges were personality challenges. Also, there were power trip kind of challenges. So all these things I think you can, you might experience in some of the coalition. And because of that, I had the option of, of either, I could have like, you know, flexed my muscle and say, hey, you know, blah, 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 and this, but I really felt like I I wanted to be true to the fact that the table is equal and everybody gets to choose what they want to do. So I stepped back and and then we started this the, the Me For You um, organization because I didn't see this one accomplishing the goal that we needed to do as far as and getting our civic engagement stuff moving forward. Even though it was a civic engagement kind of a thing, there was just too much drama a little bit there. So I stepped back, kind of let everybody grow through, go through their growing pains or whatever pains 
um, that we're all going through there, but started this other coalition, the Me For You co um, Coalition. And it's with that coalition that um, uh, one of the things that I made sure of is that the people that came on were, were true leaders and that had real interest in the community, people that were passionate about their work in civic engagement, people that really wanted to make a difference in their community, people who had records um, you know, of, of being in the community and making a difference and showing that. So I think for me, that was one of the things that I learned from this coalition development and moved on to this one that has kind of um, worked better. Oh, Anyone? Yeah. Um, I'll start with an internal one and then go to an external challenge. Internally, as a grasshops organization, which means that our board of directors is a supermajority, uh, supermajority of member agencies on the board, um, and I think coming at times. Uh, to a table together because a lot of our decision making practices happens through our membership. It's not, you know, I think something's a great idea, we're going to do it. Um, some of the bigger decisions come through our Immigrant Leaders Council or our Board of Directors. And at times that can uh, become frustrating for other members who aren't members of either. So they're not a member of the Immigrant Leaders Council and they're not a member of the Board of Directors and they're slightly confused on why we were taking so long to make a decision on something. Um, and I think that the process is really important and that's where a lot of the issues that sometimes we don't see um, are getting hammered out. Um, so I think that that has always been something where we internally as a staff are trying to really make sure that it's being clearly communicated what the process is, how we're coming together to make the decision, and moving that forward. Um, an external challenge, I would say, is um, we're unique. I think that there are a lot of different coalitions that are uh, ethnic-based, and we're not. We're all immigrant all refugees from the state of New York. Um, and in that, it makes it uh, complicated when we're dealing with external partners who are not members of our coalition or national coalitions or national alliances who are serving one specific ethnic group. And at times, their decisions may impact another group that we're working with negatively. Um, so just backtracking to earlier this year when the immigration bills were being negotiated, one thing that we kept saying when the DREAM Act kept coming up is it must be a clean DREAM Act. Because we knew that they wanted to end the diversity visa, which would negatively harm the African immigrant community the most, the reunification program, which would negatively impact the AAPI community. So we knew that there were these programs that were gonna be impacted um, and we had to stand firm, um, and that was something that was, you know, to some people's detriment and to our amazement, honestly, for them to think that we would turn our backs on certain communities that we represent was kind of baffling. Um, so I think that there's always going to be kind of the fine line of walking uh, straight with everyone when you kind of have to take a side sometimes, and that side, you won't always end up on the right side with, uh, or your allies won't end up on the right side, the side that you believe is the right side um, all the time. And I think that that's something that has been a challenge, but also something that should be kind of expected now. And I think that um, what that means to us is that we have to do more relationship building. We have to do more uh, work to really get folks to be on the same page because justice isn't just about us, it's about all of us. So I think one of the unique things about coalition building is that you always are building. And so we are, I mean, we're not perfect in the sense that we're, we're still learning, you know, what are the best practices for the ACE network in the state of Ohio, but um, in 2014, we basically did an entire reboot of our network. So we dropped all of our contracts. We wrote them completely new in what we call this a la carte style. So um, our, we allowed our partners to pick and choose what how they want to build out their contract based on 
um, you know, how much voter registration would it cost if you do X amount of voter registration hours, you'll get paid this much money. If you do X amount of GOTV events, you'll get paid this much money. Um, and we introduced that to our 13 partners um, as, a, as a new look or a, a refresh in terms of like how we take on civic engagement in the state and how we allow our partners to be their own individuals and their own organizations to really frame what civic engagement looks like for their organization so in the long run that they are you know developing out not just a program because the funding is available but they're developing, de developing out a program that's going to um, you know build out their organizational infrastructure and once this funding um, is completed, allows them to be marketable for other civic engagement funding, um, the very many um, availabilities of civic engagement funding in the state of Ohio right now. Um, so we basically, we refreshed our group, we, we dropped our name, we used to be called VERB, which stood for uh, Voter Registration Empowerment Project. That name wasn't liked very much by our organizations because it sounds like VERB. Um, <laughs> So we dropped our name and we went with the ACE Network, which goes through the hashtag of ACE the Vote. Um, and then we also, we, we realized that we needed to add on partners outside of the AAPI community. So um, we began, naturally we've had relationships with folks like the League of Women's Voters to translate voter guides and we've been partnering with um, other multi-ethnic organizations such as CARE um, in the state of Ohio. They have various chapters around the state. Um, and so naturally we added them to the organization because they were a benefit to the work that we were doing, but also they were a benefit to the coalition as a whole, um, just so we could streamline things like getting voter guides translated faster or, you know, sharing resources that were being shared in different collaborative spaces, but, you know, we should be sharing more resourcefully within amongst our own collaboration. Um, and so that allowed us to go to a 13 member organization um, and then also see our partners begin to build out their own power. So even in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be going through our second biannual uh, retreat where we're gonna build out um, power in the, in the collaborative and how does power look in the collaborative. So I mean, are we at the level in which we're perfect? No, um, I don't think we'll ever get there. You know, it's a, a working battle, but um, we definitely, if we compare ourselves to the last couple of years when we first got the funding and when civic engagement funding really changed change uh, you know across the nation with the concept of the culture convener um, we definitely are in a better state now than we were a couple of years ago so for me um I'll, I'll just give it straight to y'all the coalition building is really rough it's really tough um, and you know we uh, at the power coalition we battled a lot of different challenges um, so just for example, you know, I mentioned that the Culture Foundation gave um, uh, some funding to 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 Vela, and we we granted um, a hundred thousand dollars out to um, different organizations that were doing the work already with no money. So just imagine having resource to do what you've been doing for a long time, um, and that's because of the success that we um, bought out, um, folks. Um, different foundations started to look at our coalition and was like, well, man, like, how do y'all do this? And how much was it, right? Can we can we be a part of this? Can we fund y'all too? So uh, we were able to attract national foundations and, um, and and people, and obviously, you know, they, they want to fund the Power Coalition. But from there, obviously, you know, they're created some competition or they, there's power, money and power, you know, that's pretty dirty, right? So um, so there was actually groups within the power coalition who actually wanted to take me out um, because they wanted to get access to funding. They wanted to control the money. Um, and also they were, and I later found out that they were actually creating, they created a different coalition in tandem and using what we were doing at the same time. To, 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 to get access to the funding once they take you know some of the, the coalition numbers down. So when we obviously we shut it down um, really quick and we kind of talked to the funders to let them know, hey this is this is what's happening. Um, so so I just wanted to share that like money coming to this is is a is a big deal, right? Now I mean we um, to today we uh, we outside of culture we even fund we 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 grant a half a million dollars 
this year to different organizations from the Power Coalition. So, so, so that's just to share with y'all, um, this work is really well, it's really tough. You really have to build trust um, amongst each other and really kind of understand like where are we going, you know, and, and, and who's going with us. And uh, without relationships, without the trust, you can't really build anything. You can't really build power. And I'm, 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 I would want to say that like I'm glad and I'm lucky that the people who were uh, a part of this coalition, some of them really uh, believe in the work that we're doing. They trust the work that uh, they trust me to lead uh, the, the the coalition, and to the point where we are um, becoming um, uh, uh, an anchor to the state of Louisiana around the progressive movement. And you know, for me, I, I am you know slowly stepping back. But obviously, creating something that um, that is going to, to to last longer and making huge impact uh, for the community. So, uh, so yeah, I just uh, just caution, you know, uh, in terms of money, money does create a lot of power, um, and from there it creates problem. <laughs> um, and that's where the challenges that we have faced, and you know, I can go into deep, deep, deep into the other challenges, but that's just like the, the surface thing that I want to share with y'all. Um, but I think you know, just understanding the value um, of the coalition is something that we all have to build up first, right? Like, what do we value? You know, what do we all value? If we don't value family, you don't value like people and respect, then you can't be a part of this, this coalition. Right, so I think that's sort of the things that we had to lay out before, and and uh, we actually had to ask some of the the coalition members to to leave because those wasn't the values that they hold, um, and uh, so that's sort of the things that you know we uh, have have built and we're continuing to build uh, for the future. So great, thanks, man. Um, so. Yeah, moving on, uh, I want to ask sort of um, like a few questions in a row and just like have you guys respond to a few of them because you know we're going to come up to the end of our time soon. So uh, can you talk about the sort of the best nuts and bolts in running coalitions? So there's no secret sauce to coalitions. I think the, the best thing that you could say in terms of like being close to that would be uh, that building of trust, um, which you know can come in different ways. Uh, but yeah, in terms of like kind of good practices, good like processes, um, you know, like in terms of uh, like a structure or a frequency of meeting. You talked about a, uh, a retreat that you're about to do. Um, you know, and, and then also like how do you have buy-in at all of the levels of your organization as well as the other organizations, you know, and, and anything else that comes to mind. Like, uh, are there kind of good nuts and bolts uh, to follow for those who are here working on coalitions? And then, so that's one question. Another question, uh, so, you know, a different type of question, um, but, you know, as you have expanded uh, your work to be multicultural, to be uh, in diverse coalitions, you know, there's pervasive racist anti-blackness in some or all of our, you know, Asian communities, uh, as well as long-standing sexist at attitudes, homophobia, and how have you dealt with that in your coalitions and organizations? Um, if that has come up as, a, as an issue, um, have you tried anything proactively or how have you dealt with it um, you know, as it's come up? I know that you know, money, as Min said, you know, it can complicate things and it actually sort of will amplify uh, any kind of fault lines um, within the coalition uh, along, along, those kind of, uh, uh, along those lines. So um, yeah, if you could talk to that. And um, yeah, I think those two qu two questions uh, might carry us um, for a few minutes. Huh? Okay, I'll start. It doesn't have to be the same order. Yeah, I know. Everybody's <laughs> looking at me probably because I'm the older one on here. No, I'm just um, okay, um, I'll talk a little bit about the structure of uh, of our coalition. I, I mentioned a little bit about uh, a little bit about it earlier, um, but basically, like I said, we all come to the table um, as equals. Uh, there is no chairperson. There is no 
um, treasurer, there is no one other. The, the one person that we do have is that liaison person, which is a person that NTAS hires. And that person, sole responsibility is to make sure that there's that monthly meeting going on, everybody gets alerted, the agenda gets put together, everybody's included, you have, you know, what do you want in the agenda, um, and all that kind of stuff. And if anybody else needs anything, so we have one person that really doesn't have a, it's really not a part of the coalition, but it's basically a liaison between all the different organizations to make things move forward. So like I said, there is no chairperson, there is no president, there's no whatever. So everyone is, is equal. So that's kind of like the structure that we have used for our um, coalition is and it's and it's been very successful we've had a few uh coalition um uh, an organization coalition member what have you um i have found that as things move forward that you know they kind of wean themselves out if certain things don't seem to fly um uh, in their direction so that's kind of like a positive too in that some people just kind of um if things don't work for them, they just kind of fade out. And not with us pushing them out or anything, they just kind of you know, go about their way. Uh, so that too is, is uh, for us, is a positive. Um, as far as the, the, the anti-black uh, issue and things of color, um, we have not really experienced that in our, and if people are experiencing it as individuals or within their organization, it's really not brought to the table because that's something that um, it's not tolerated. Or so I have not really heard anything like that come up at our coalition meetings and things, things like that. So um, I think we've been um, lucky in that. Uh, just for the panelists, um, I, I think there was a little misunderstanding. We um, have like around 15 minutes left for like Q and A and our stuff. So, just give me a time check. <laughs> um, so for us, we have uh, we created an integrated civic engagement flowchart. So maybe I could, you know, this is well, the cheat sheet for y'all. So what we do is we we, we begin to um, put together something called like a listening session. We we host like the people's agenda conference, like a summit. So that's where we uh, listen to the community needs. Right? From there, we develop an agenda. And then we build a target universe around that. And then from there, we engage, we educate, and organize those who, you know, who are affected, or those, even those who um, who's in our universe. And then from there, we can mobilize for change. Right? If pe people will, will listen to us, or would have more buy-in if they get a voice in it. Right? If education, if immigration, if criminal justice is something that they think about every day when they wake up, they will buy into it and they will support the work that we do. So I think that's one of the things that we, I, I believe that we do really well is like we start from the ground. Right? Bringing people like mom, pop, grandma, grandpa, whatever, right? we bring them to the table and ask them, what are, you, what are, what are your needs? What is, what is bothering you? What is keeping you up at night? And then from there, we could actually really put together something that we all could um, could own, and that's where I think um, where we could push an agenda from from the top uh, to the top level, right? And I think from there, you know, we also our coalition work is, is really unique. We don't push people to do something that they're not comfortable with doing, and I think that's one of the things that make us really successful. If you're good at policy work, you focus on policy work and like. Do the best, and for us, like for Vela, we GOTV get out the vote stuff is our baby. Like we run the GOTV for we train our coalition members um, how to do GOTV across the state of Louisiana, right? Um, and 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 you know, there's folks who are dealing with affordable housing. Great, do that work. We will support you. Whatever message that you need us to to push out, we will push that out around criminal, criminalization. We also do a lot of that. One of the cool things that, you know, I don't know if it hit um, national news yet, but one of the things that um, our, one of our partner vote basically is called this uh, voice of the, uh, the experience. We were able to support the effort to re-enfranchise 70,000 people who are on probation or parole the rights to vote, right? So yes, we, we have a living population where folks are, people can't, they, they, there's policy that, 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 that keeps us from, well, keep us oppressed. 
So we need to figure out how to change those type of policies, right? And we work really hard. I mean, we, to the point where we have like John Legend like supporting us. You know, John Legend. Oh, me. Oh, yeah. so, so, so even with the, like, from them, I think this is really important for for us to do that type of work, right? They focus on the focus on, on on the policy. We do the groundwork. And that's how we really work together to to really impact change, because uh, we, again, like you know, we can't work in silos because we're not going to win that way, not at all. Uh, I mean, quick quick follow up question. So, if you guys are doing different work, then um, is there a way that you are like uh, doing a contract, like you're doing, you know, your MOUs, like? Rather than doing something standard, some groups are doing something. Some groups. Yeah. So so yeah. So everybody have their own role. Like they, we just know our place um, in in the coalition. Again, like if you're working on policy work around criminal justice, we know that whatever message they need us to send or educate, we would do. We would take that on like the Vela side. We would be the one on the phone bank, doing phone banking, talk about criminal justice to get data for the the uh, for our policy. Bonks, right. So when we go to legislators or we go to Congress, we would say these amount of people who are your voters, and we could we could show them data that they want this. And if they don't listen to us, we will unseat them. Not me, but you know other people will. Um, we would tell, tell like because you're not listening to us. Um, you know, we, we will have to figure another route. Does that make sense? Uh, no, so, I, meant, I meant between the organizations. Like, if they're like, we're, we're doing policy work, we're going to do GOTV work, um, but these are totally different. And so it's like, how do you kind of... So, uh, so yeah, so we, 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 look, we look at this, like the, the path to power, right? Pathway to power. So how do we actually have power, right? Policy folks can't just do work from the policy level if they don't have people on the ground. Does that make sense? So we we will say, okay, so Vela, what, what is your responsibility? What is your stake in this coalition? And we say, well, we want to make sure that we have power, right? But we know, so we will take on the GOTV work, get out the vote, voter registration, all that great stuff. But we don't do, we won't actively do the policy work, but we have an organization that just focus on policy. But we make sure we can make the connection between the two. Does that make sense? So that way, our work will actually, in, in terms of like contract, like, no, I, I think you know, it's, it's all about building trust, right? We understand why we do the work that we do. We just can't do it alone. You're gonna close this out with a John Legend song, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things that I, you know, when we did the refresh, um, we also made very clear that the ACE network is a network controlled by the partners. Um, and so our contracts, again, is something that they build for themselves. They pick out if they're going to engage in voter registration at how much, you know, at what level are they going to engage. If they're going to do GOTV, at what level are you able to engage? Or if you're going to just focus on educational events, at what level are you going to do that? So. Our contracting style is not the general 250 VRs, two GOTV events, two phone banking, two door knocking, three educational events. It really is an opportunity for them to pick and choose their flavors um, that they know if they have a strong point in and really elevate the strong point in the community and work with other partners in the community. Each of our regions has at least two to three partners, um, some even more, um, that they can collaborate with to build power and, and build um, civic participation in the region. Um, another thing that we did with, so we host biannual retreats. We do those twice a year, um, one poster pre-November um, and then once uh, somewhere between the um, primary elections. And um, at our retreats, uh, our partners chose what their mission and vision was. They built that out for an entire half a day. Um, they chose what the policy issues we're going to focus on. They ranked it based on importance. They chose how our programming was going to work. They pro they worked on if we're going to focus on youth leadership more so than you know building up coalition power and things like that. Um, so the the way that ACE Network was is formed now is very much based on you know how they want to see the East Network evolve over the next couple of years as we, you know, prepare ourselves for the 2020 census. 
Um, and so I think that's one of the really unique things in terms of you know how our coalition is formed and, and how we work together and we collaborate together to build trust and to build open communications um, is really allowing them to feel that they do have a sense of you know, a play in, in the network um, that they can email at any time of day all the partners. It's not something that's controlled just by Asia or that the money is just controlled by Asia. They see how much all of our partners are being funded. We sent this spreadsheet. So it's not just, you see your part, you know, your funding levels, you see everyone's funding levels. You see how much everyone is doing in terms of voter registration. You see how many, how much we're getting commitments around GOTV. So we're very transparent in terms of like how we work and how we, um, collaborate with one another, um, so we hold no secrets when when it comes down to it. Um, in terms of, um, I guess you know some issues or areas that you know around like um, racial issues or racial equity, we haven't really ran into too many of those issues. Um, there are times where you know we talk about. Uh, our policy initiatives and what policy stances we want to take on and there are some disagreements but I think one of the things that we really try to work towards is um, pushing through those disagreements and determining um, you know what is our ultimate stance going to be as an ACE network and collaboratively collaboratively working with each other to um, formulate what our, our stance are around policy um, and I think the last thing that's really unique about our network is that um, it's not always Asia who's the one who's doing the traveling. We really foster that we um, have our volunteers and the different organizations uh, have the opportunity to go out and you know sit in on trainings and conferences and get the opportunity to network with others across the state. So um, really being able to build up our youth, our interns, and then also others within the network is um, something that we really value as well as a whole. Great. Murad, uh, before you go, I'm going to ask the audience for their questions, and then I'm going to let you have the first word on that. Um, so do people have any questions related to coalition, coalition building, uh, you know, working in diverse coalitions? Uh, I have a question. My name is Taket. Uh, I'm from the University of Pittsburgh. I'm a senior right now studying marketing. Um, and me and a couple of students were working on this program where we call Pitt Civics, um, and basically, uh, what this is, um, is we're trying to start uh, um, a center for civic engagement at the University of Pittsburgh. It's an idea that is pretty hot with a lot of um, universities across the country right now. Um, and uh, it seems as if the idea has caught fire at the University of Pittsburgh as well with a lot of different faculty, staff, um, and even university efforts toward it. But um, my, my general feeling is that Pitt Civics was the first one to come out with it. Um, the idea on the campus, um, be working toward it, and on the scale that uh, is larger than um, any, anyone else. So some people are focused on categorizing civic engagement events that um, happen on campus currently. Some groups are focusing on ones that don't happen. Um, and we're trying to create, you know, all of that. We're trying to create the things that a lot of people are doing already and put it all into one place. Um, but as we're going through this, as we're going through senior administration at, at the university, we're running into a lot of like politics and problems with senior administration wanting to kind of change the direction of which we want to go, not just create a center for civic engagement for all disciplines, but kind of focus it more toward policy or focus it more toward um, uh, politics or uh, something that we don't believe the direction of what Pitt Civics should, should be. So my question is that, I know you guys deal a lot with different coalitions or different um, groups and come together in that way, but right now I'm dealing with different groups that are working toward the same goal in a sense, um, but uh, are kind of trying to step on top of each other to achieve that goal. So I wanted to see, as Pitt Civics, I feel as if we have the overbearing, um, the, the biggest goal out of everyone, the, the one that... Um, uh, encompasses everything that everyone is trying to do. I wanted to see how we could stay on top of that and make sure that we're achieving the entirety of our mission rather than diluting it down to what other people think should be the mission. Thank you. Any other questions? Andy? Do you want me to grab an answer that real quick? Um, maybe we could collect a few just because of, uh, of the time. Just real quick, I had a question. Just would love to hear your experiences or thoughts about um, 
our organization is part of a larger immigrant coalition that are definitely are building community organizing groups um, uh, that want to move issue campaigns. But our local coalition of Asian American organizations is kind of a hybrid of some power building, but some service organizations that are a little more value neutral as far as their interest in running issue campaigns. And I just, you know, we've always looked at it as them being. Um, it being defensive and keeping the door open for them, right? Of keeping them also accountable from being co-opted by those in power. But I was curious, like, how you all navigate the thoughts of, man, we just let's just take these four organizations that are just ride or die for you know everything you want to do versus having a bigger tent, right? All right, great. Uh, so we'll get responses. Mara, you want to go for it? Okay, I'll, I'll respond to the first one. I'll okay. throw my thoughts out on that one uh, because I was getting pissed as you were talking. <laughs> but I think first and foremost, the thing that you need to recognize is that on campus, the most, empower the most powerful voices are students. So you get students to rally around your cause and take it to that upper person for sure that, you know, if you get enough there, the changes is going to happen. The other thing is, is that you can also, within the uh, university or colleges, there are already student association associated uh, in place like Latino Student Association, Pacific Islander Student Association, Asian Student Association. So some of the some of your thoughts and things are if you're running into blocks and walls up there, you can also start implementing your thoughts and your things within those organizations that are already functioning with the desire that you have. So that you know you get people that are passionate, students that are passionate in those areas that are part of that, and you can have like those civic engagement as part of each of those student organization, and then together you come every month to meet as part of the civic engagement student, but then yet they are a part of all the other student organizations. So you just kind of have to kind of like uh, act like you're liquid and just kind of melt around and make things work. But student voices are very powerful. Any other responses? Um, to the second question, uh, I think that that's always a challenge. Um, we've seen that happen time and again where uh, you'll have, so just to go back to uh, James's first question to the panel, what's your structure? Um, just to answer that really quickly, we have, we've broken the state up into nine different regions and we have set, staff dedicated to each region. We have five offices across the state, so that allows us to have bi-monthly uh, meetings with our membership. Um, and in that process, uh, after, so in July we begin our uh, round tables and each region will have a round table which will help us figure out what we're going to be fighting for in the next legislative cycle. Um, as we move forward from there, uh, once we're done with the round tables, we go through a membership-wide survey. Um, and that survey helps us narrow down the priorities that we're going to fight for at the state level together, collectively. Um, and that is broken up into two separate areas. There is a budget process that we are going to agree to uh, agenda and then a legislative one. Um, because we're in New York State, we have a part-time legislator, which means that they only meet for like 45 days in six months. Um, so from January to mid-June, they meet. From January to March is the budget. From April to June is the legislative cycle. Hopefully, everyone is uh, stay like it's a very short period of time. Um, so by September ish, we have a draft that is ready to be presented to our immigrant leaders council um, of what the priorities will be um, or should be, and then it goes to our board of directors who then approve it which then gets kicked off at our member congress in January. Um, and at our member congress, you have every kind of organization that's a part of our membership there. Uh, you have uh, organizing groups, uh, social service organizations, policy organizations, and everyone's coming to rally around this agenda that we're about to launch because it's really touching, uh, the, really focusing on the needs of all our communities together. Um, and we stop prioritizing, so it's not numbered in any way. Um, but we do it by budget. This is what we're asking for for the state legislator to fund. And then on the legislative side, this is what we're asking for uh, for the policy angle. Um, so keeping those organizations engaged, and I think it's keeping all of our members engaged is our goal. Um, and letting the social service agencies know that we're going to go for, to bat with them for them 
when they want to cut the adult literacy education funding. We're going to go to bat for them when the legal services funding is getting cut or not renewed. Um, but they need to come to bat when it's, it's not transactional, it's just showing up. Um, and showing up without us having to beg you to be there in a way, you know what I mean? So I think that um, it's because we've been, and the, other, the bigger part of it is the relationship building. Because we're meeting so often, people are engaging with one another, and sometimes social service agencies who don't normally take a policy position on something will, in the interest of justice, to stand with their allies and their partners and their coalition. Um, and I think that that relationship building happens over years, because some of the organizations that are just now taking policy positions that are social service or organizations, um, some of their first uh, policy uh, positions are, you know, making sure that we have driver's licenses for all New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status. And I think that that, is, that kind of gives you the spectrum of the organizations um, within the field that we're working with. Um, but then you have some social service organizations who sign up for everything and just don't show up either, right? So we, I want to just get to one more question before we're coming right, right to the end. Okay, thanks. Uh, so one last question. Um, wait, first back there. No, that may be the last one. It, there's many other questions. Anyway, okay. so James had asked a question. Hi, I'm Glenn. Had asked a question about you were working coalition with LGBTQ communities. I didn't hear any panelists answer that question. So it would be nice, although Vail, I know you do some great work. And the reason why I think it's important is because like the LGBT community has done some tremendous work and has been tremendously successful. Yet it is a very small numeric population in this country. Like agents, they have been able to have their community at so many levels in companies, corporate, grassroots, advocacy, nonprofit, the entertainment industry, and they've won. Asians, in some way, have similar attributes to the LGBT community. Why are we not at that same level? And I think some of us are trying to get there. But I was wondering if y'all could answer the topic that's on the title, coalition building around civic engagement with LGBT communities. It'd be nice to hear something about that. Yes. Great. And then one another question here? Did you want to? Thanks. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I could definitely answer um, some of it, but... Oh, I, I mean, know you can. Okay, okay. <laughs> oh, nobody else. I can also answer. I think that we have a diversity in our membership that when the LGBTQ community steps up and shows up every single time, um, it really does uh, illustrate what an ally and what someone who's standing up for justice really is. Um, one community that I think has been... Uh, showing up the most for the Muslim community and the Masa community and the MENA community in New York has been the LGBTQ community. And that is illustrated in every single thing that has happened around the Muslim ban. So I think that the way that we have been intentional in ensuring that every voice is heard at the table has been really making sure that we're integrating not only uh, you know the forward uh, leading immigrant rights organizations, but making sure that every immigrant right uh, immigrant community group is heard. And I think that one other piece is that uh, there are a lot of different organizations that are really coming up to the table right now to do immigration work. And I think that there needs to be uh, a way that we engage groups and how to show up to. Um, and really give uh, some of their commitment to how they're coming to work with other communities. Okay, i just like to add, one of the things about a uh, multicultural, diverse uh, coalition is that many, uh, it, it's brought to, to um, it, it comes together because of, of uh, being ostracized, being marginalized you know we all go through these different um these different issues and when something comes up we all jump up for an example when one uh, we had an lgb run for um a gay lesbian uh, lady run for mayor of salt lake city and of course um reached out to our multicultural and, and many other folks but many of us are multicultural um, um 
of folks that we had worked with stepped up and really rallied around her and, and she won. The very first um, gay woman to be a mayor in Salt Lake City. And so it was a, a big win for, for the gay and lesbian um, population in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, and so um, I think some of the, for an example, the other thing is uh, when there was a big uh, push to, to uh, to put away the bear's ears, which is a sacred, uh, um, <coughs> excuse me, sacred location for Native Americans. Not Sorry, no, we're out of time. Stop crying. And, um, the Native Americans came to the coalition to ask for help and so we rallied around that to get people out to, to speak up and to uh, in, a, in less than a week we were able to get over a thousand people to do a rally in Salt Lake City uh, from all different communities that's okay it's thank you um, and to rally around that and so um, the coalition multicultural coalition you have a reach that when, when there's a cause or there's a need, you can immediately not snap your fingers. It's hard work, but to get people to rally around different issues. When it was, um, when we had an issue that talked about, um, yeah, a lot of people reached out where they were not, they didn't know anything about the legislative stuff. They didn't know. So we put a legislative session together just a couple, just last month, we put a know your rights because a lot of our people were being thrown into jail. And people that should have been doing seven years is now doing 15 years. People that should have been doing 10 years is doing 50 years for all different reasons. So we had a know your rights uh, things, you know, which was me experiencing ethnic community. So in a multicultural coalition, you can address the different issues that you feel are being marginalized because of who we are, whether we're gay or lesbian, whether we're Native Americans, whether we're Pacific Islanders, Asians, what have you. I just wanted to add, just quick, quickly, I know uh, we're out of time. So for us right now, we're pushing for municipal ID just because we know that that will, um, will support those who have been incarcerated, who's just coming out, uh, for those who are transitioning or have transitioned, um, and also for, for the undocumented population, right? But we see that as an opportunity for our transgender population to actually go out and vote using their ID, Minnesota ID. So that's one of the things that we're pushing right now um, in New Orleans. The other thing is that um, for those who, who, who do know Vela, we, we actually have a radio station. Um, and we use a radio station to actually educate the community about LGBT rights, um, about the LGBT community. Uh, we also use it as a vehicle to talk about anti-blackness in our community. Um, so, so that's one of the things that we are doing right now. And, and quite frankly, our, our civic engagement team is made up with uh, a lot of our, our queer youth. Um, so they, they lead the fight for, for our, our organization. So. And lastly, in Ohio, we just wrapped up one of our largest um, AAPI legislative days in the state of Ohio, um, where we met with over 35 of our state uh, legislators, where we talked about areas such as uh, hate crimes and gun control and immigration status in the community. Um, and we saw over, over 400 individuals come out to that event as well. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to everybody here, to the panelists especially. Um, you know, going forward, especially in this time, uh, I think the necessity for us to build bridges, um, as many bridges as we can, uh, is uh, going to be um, fundamental uh, to the kind of America that we're going to be part of. So uh, with that, thank you again. Um, uh, and I'll give it back to Eric. Yeah, all right. Thank you, James. Um, again, thank you, James, and you know. Uh